Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is Thursday, April 22nd of 2021, and I'm going to be discussing a concept that happens on certain people on mechanical ventilation called double triggering. First, let's start off by defining double triggering. It is something that occurs, as I mentioned before, on patients who are on mechanical ventilation. If you are a layperson or not too familiar with the ventilator, they would interpret this by watching the patient as somebody who's fighting the ventilator. At the end of the day, it's one of the types of dyssynchrony, and many of us have seen plenty of this during the course of the pandemic. I must disclose that over a podcast type format that it's kind of hard to describe what the waveforms are doing or what the patient looks like. So one day I might go ahead and create a YouTube video or something to better illustrate what I'm trying to say. But double triggering is what we see when a patient takes a breath on the ventilator, they go ahead, they get their set inspiratory timer, however long their inhalation breath is going to be. And as that breath goes ahead and finishes, the patient goes ahead and takes another breath immediately, immediately thereafter, or, you know, even if they have a very short expiratory time after, because at the end of the day, we take a deep breath in, like I just did, and then you go ahead and exhale. And generally speaking, the normal I to E ratio of inspiratory time to expiratory time is about one to three, right? That type of ratio. But in this case, the patient does not go ahead and exhale all the way. And they just trigger the machine to go ahead and give them another breath, hence double triggering. So you might ask, why is double triggering a problem? Well, the ventilator alarms are going to you know, go haywire, start beeping, alarming, et cetera, obviously causing us to lose our minds because they're so annoying. But the reason why these pressures go up is because the patient's got another set of tidal volume forced into their lungs. And, you know, this is not good for the patient because it causes barrel trauma and other type of injuries to the actual patient's lungs. Some people might go ahead and call this breath stacking. And again, there are better resources than this particular podcast if you want to take a deeper dive into what double triggering is. But again, what it is, is the patient takes two triggers, so to speak, to receive a breath from the, the ventilator. Well, when this goes ahead, when this goes ahead and happens on our patients, the typical workup that the respiratory therapist as well as clinicians go ahead and take include checking a blood gas to make sure that we are meeting the ventilatory demands of the patients. Many times, many institutions uh, unfortunately have like the set protocol and a set I to E ratio on the ventilator, but this is where we need to go in there, spend some time with the ventilator, with the patient, and titrate this I to E ratio to provide the correct amount of ventilation for our patients. I'm not going to go ahead and dive into the vent modes because, again, that's a completely different kind of worms. But in assist control or volume control, as some people call it, which is the primary mode of ventilation that I use in, in certain patients, again, numerous different opinions on how to how to how to manage ventilators and again that's beyond the scope of um, beyond the scope of this podcast on volume control the patient just goes ahead and initiates the breath and then the ventilator goes ahead and delivers them the set tidal volume again hence it being uh, volume control so we are all mostly speaking using lung protective strategies to avoid barrel trauma so the set tidal volumes are reflective of the ideal body weight of the patient Something else that could be tinkered to try to fix this, this breath stacking is respiratory rate. You could also go ahead and adjust the flow for these patients. But even in the best case scenario with the best tinkering that we could do, there's still some issues with double triggering. And this is where we go ahead and we reach out to our friendly, friendly nursing staff and ask them to please go ahead and increase the, the sedation to a RAS of negative four or negative five. And at times, you know, we have no choice but to go ahead and reach for paralytics. And I honestly hate this because the paralytics means that we're going to have long consequences for these patients and they're probably going to be weak when they get out of all this and, you know, all those things that are basically wrapped together with diving, diving down this deep hole of deep sedation and paralytics. So it's not hard to understand how double triggering could be deleterious to our patients. I mean, like I said before, you could cause a significant amount of barrel trauma. But to give more context to this, yesterday there was a paper published in Critical Care Medicine out of Brazil, and I definitely got to tip my hat to the authors, that is titled Clusters of Double Triggering Impact Clinical Outcomes. And they have this whole uh, long name that will bore you to death if I go ahead and read it. But 
the tough thing about this paper is, as I usually tell you to not trust me, and uh, you know, this is not medical advice. This this paper is, hi is hiding behind a paywall. So unless you have a subscription to critical care medicine or a way around the paywall, you're going to have to just kind of trust me on this one. So uh, what I will do is just go ahead and kind of give you an idea of what the article says. They basically separated the patients into groups that had a low cumulative duration of clusters and a high duration of uh, a high cumulative duration of clusters. And what they found was that the people who had the more clusters of double triggering, well, this is where these things were very important. They found that these patients who would have more double triggering would have a longer duration of mechanical ventilation in all comers. They also had a longer duration of mechanical ventilation in survivors. They had fewer ventilator-free days. They spent a longer time in the ICU. They had a higher ICU mortality. And again, this was 67% mortality compared to 28. And they had a higher, in a higher hospital mortality where 73% of the patients had a, 73% uh, of patients died versus 39% in the lower group. But here's, here's where, and I know that all this information, like as one could imagine, right? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, hey, if the patient's finding the vent more, it's probably because there's something wrong with the patient, right? It's it's kind of like a no-brainer. But it really disappoints me that in this article, the majority of the goodies in it were actually in the supplement as opposed to the actual article. And this includes the fact that in the baseline characteristics of those patients who had more double triggering issues, again, the patients who were fighting the vent more had a baseline arterial pH of 7.16 versus those who didn't buck the vent that much they had a pH of 7.36. I mean, <laughs> these patients are sicker. You need to ventilate them more. That's why um, it's it's kind of a no-brainer to see how they would fight the vent more. But again, this was not clearly disclosed in the actual article itself, which is why I always say you got to read it for yourself. But in addition, although it wasn't statistically significant, the PF ratio was much lower in the patients who had double triggering, who had more double triggering event. And the p-value to this was 0.06, so it was not statistically significant. The other thing that was very close to being statistically significant but wasn't was the fact that the PCO2, in other words, the, the carbon dioxide that was the patients had in their system, was 42 in the patients who had less double triggering effects and 49 in those who had more uh, double triggering effects. So Again, these patients needed to be ventilated, vent, ventilated more. This is <laughs> so they were sicker. They needed to be ventilated more. You can see why they had more, uh, more, if more, more issues. But again, I just wish that they didn't bury this in the supplement table and they were more up front of it. Because at the end of the day, we all know that the sicker patients we have, the worse the outcome. Whenever I grab a hold of a medical journal article or a paper just like this one, I honestly sit back and I wonder how this is going to change my practice. And in this case, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but I'm being honest here. This is my opinion. I don't think that this paper offers very much. Of course, somebody who has a lower pH is going to do worse than a patient who has a higher pH. A patient with a higher baseline CO2, PCO2, excuse me, is going to do worse than a patient who has a lower PCO2. This is this this does not take a, a large study to kind of figure out. Um, and, you know, it's not, if these patients were sicker from the baseline, again, do we could we really make a correlation that the double triggering is what's causing a problem? We all know that double triggering causes problems. Yes, absolutely, of course. But but it's I don't know, whatever. I I digress. Um, one of the things I wish that they did was tease out if there was a particular ventilator setting, sedation strategy, or management pearl to help us avoid the double triggering in these patients. That that would be a better thing to do with this collection of of information. Again. Um, I'm not trying to be too harsh on these folks because it's a very cool article, but what we've learned is something that we know. So I guess we didn't learn it after all. And that's that sicker patients have worse outcomes. Or perhaps I missed something. And if I did, please come reach out to me. We can have a conversation about it and, um, you know, figure out what this study is good for. But the main thing that we should all consider is obviously fix the underlying problem and fix it fast. Yeah, I think I, I, think I should finish with this article because I'm going off on a, on a rant right now. Nonetheless, I uh, hope you guys all have a great day and find some value from the stuff I'm doing. Maybe I'll do more stuff on ventilators. But honestly, there are people out there in the social media educational realm that I'm in who honestly do fantastic ventilator work. So to a certain extent, I'd rather let them do it because they're doing it better than me.
All right, guys. Have a great day. Bye.